college football playoff, Sugar Bowl in the books. How about this sound right here? You ever heard this before? You know what comes after that. The splattering. Right there in front of God and everyone for the world to see in the Superdome. Ohio State 49, Clemson 28. This one, uh, in some ways, just to be honest with you, it kind of doesn't even feel like it was as close as that. Ohio State put on a clinic last night against Clemson, the likes of which I don't think anyone, including especially first and foremost Dabo Swinney, ever expected. I know that that whole narrative of ranking them 11th is beat to death. I, I get all that. I'm not even going down that road. That's too lazy. So here's what I want to talk about. First off, I want to talk about the performance of Justin Fields' career, the performance of this Ohio State team season to date. They got one more now as a result of last night's win, and we'll see if they can peak again against Alabama. Remember when we were going into this game, I thought Clemson would win a close game. Took Ohio State in the points, uh, so I was wrong on the straight-up pick. The reason that I thought it would be close, and the reason, as it turns out, Ohio State ended up blowing Clemson out, is because of that mythical complete game that's always out there. You, you are not going to have a roster, in all likelihood, like Ohio State has, and never put a complete game together. And here's the thing about having a roster like Ohio State. See, every team's got their complete game. If you're, you know, Akron, your complete game is still may not be good enough to beat most teams on your schedule. But there is a maximum capacity that every team is capable of performing at. And the more talented you are, obviously the higher that is. When you see Ohio State and you see them a uh, 13-point win over Penn State or you know six points in the middle of the third quarter against Northwestern, you know they have not put together their complete game yet. Now, the concern is, well, they only played six games, so is it ever going to happen? Well, it happened last night. And when it does happen, the final score that you were looking at on your TV screen, that can be the result, 49-28. to 28. So let's dive into this a little bit. Man, there's so many different things you can talk about here. Justin Fields, I remember looking at him after the Northwestern game. When the clock hit zero, for those of you who still were tuned into the game, they zoomed in on his face. And for a guy who had just won a conference championship, uh, to quote Rube Baker in Major League Two, he looked like his best pig had just died. And because he knew his performance wasn't good enough. This is just holding yourself to a different standard. And uh, he met the standard last night. Uh, my goodness. So the, the stat line in and of itself is already impressive. 22 of 28, 385 yards, six touchdowns. When you consider a lot of that production came with busted up ribs, whether they are structurally busted up or not, they felt like it either way. That is a warrior mentality. That's a warrior performance. That is what separates elite athletes, elite competitors from just really good ones. Um, you know, Ian Book, for example, is a really good scrappy competitor. Ian Book's not capable of doing something like that. Only the best of the best are capable of doing something like that. I mean, that's, that's kind of like watching in college football what Michael Jordan used to do in big game situations. You... You, you know that there's only one guy on the field or on the court capable of it. You don't know if it's going to happen that night. But if it does happen, you know and you know which one to pinpoint. You know which guy is going to be capable of it. That's Justin Fields. But you want to know a padlock stat here? I'll deliver the padlock stat with a bow on it. You only needed to know this yesterday morning. And if you knew nothing else, you would have known how this game was going to go. 254 to 44. That was the rushing edge for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Now, I said the other day... I thought the game plan probably for Brent Venables included building in room for Ohio State to have success on the ground. Because I thought they were going to have over 200 yards success on the ground. They did. They ran for almost, well, over 250. So I thought that would happen. And I think Clemson expected them to have some success. What I thought Clemson thought they could do that they didn't do is own the red zone. That's the way they beat Alabama a couple of years ago, despite Bama hanging a ton of yards on them. I think that's what they banked on being able to do against Ohio State. They were not able to do it. And so as a result, Ohio State runs for 254. Uh, they beat you by three touchdowns. Uh, here was the other problem. I can pretty much assure you Clemson thought they were going to be able to do better than 44 on the ground. Travis Etienne, a virtual non-factor in this game. 10 carries, 32 yards, 3.2 per carry. And the other thing that stood out, a couple of vulnerabilities that have really been there all year. It's just that no one was really ready to expose it yet if Trevor Lawrence was playing for Clemson. And that was a lack of uh, top caliber offensive line and a lack of an elite playmaker core at wide receiver. They've got good players out there. Cornell Powell is a good player. Amari Rogers is a good player. Powell had really good numbers last night. That is not the kind of guy that they've had out there in the past, a game changing kind of player. It wasn't there. And so Ohio State knew that. I'll tell you what else started to happen in this game unfolded. 
Clemson takes the ball and they score on the first possession. I had a buddy, Clemson buddy, who texted me and said, man, we're, we're really missing Tony Elliott, aren't we? Offensive coordinator who was out uh, due to COVID. He's the play caller for Clemson. And it was, it was obviously a mocking tone. And the guy was suggesting to me, oh, we'll be fine. Dabo before the game, oh, they'll be fine. Well, they were fine. Here's the problem. They were fine through the script, which you should be able to do, period. I text back to my friend later uh, yeah, I mean, they were fine working through their scripted plays without Tony Elliott. That's like you being able to say, well, I'm going to be able to drive all the way to El Paso, Texas with no GPS. And the reason I know that is because I just made it to the top of my neighborhood. And so if I was able to do that, I, certainly I should be able to make it the rest of the way. No, no, that's not how that works, friend. And once they got out of that scripted series or two, they were lost. And there were multiple three and outs in the first half that Ohio State forced as a result of that. Ohio State has a lot to do with that. I'm not saying they don't. What I'm saying is when you looked at them and you, you wondered why they were so discombobulated, well, make no mistake, that has a lot to do with it. Two yards per rush. I keep looking down at this stat for Clemson. Ugh, two yards per rush. Uh, there, you know, if you've watched Ohio State this year, and I don't think a lot of you have all that much because they've played largely uninspiring opponents, shall we say. I think a lot of you maybe have glanced at them but haven't watched them intently. They don't have that star power on the defensive line, which just means their guys weren't on the cover of preview magazines because they're very good, uh, extremely good. You know, I'm looking ahead to Alabama, and I think they can probably do more to affect the interior of Alabama's offensive line, which is weakened right now with the loss of Landon Dickerson than any team Alabama's played so far this year. I mean, you, if you can disrupt timing and rhythm on the interior of one of these modern-day offenses – you got a chance to really throw a crowbar in the bicycle spokes. And that's what Ohio State was able to do enough. Again, when you can score, you can afford to give up 28. When you can't, it's a different story there. Remember what we talked about about Clemson last week? Remember when I said, I'm not a fan of one thing that Dabo Swinney does, and I haven't been a fan of it. And it hasn't reared its ugly head quite yet because uh, they've been on a climb. The trajectory of their program has been climbing and peaking for the last few years. Their fuel has been doubt. Their motivation has been disrespect. That's what they've used. They have harnessed that. They have packaged that up and they've used it as fuel. That's what they've always sold themselves on, that their kids are always preached to us against the world, back in the corner, no one believes in us, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times it works or it has in the past because they've always been an underdog. Eventually, if you're any good, that motivation source runs out. That fuel source runs out because eventually, if you're good enough, you're going to get to the mountaintop. And when you get to the mountaintop, to the point where no one disrespects you anymore, no one doubts you anymore, everyone puts you in as a seven-plus point favorite or more in every single game, well, then it rings really hollow. And then you have to try new tactics. And I don't, I told you last week, I thought a lot of Dabo Swinney talking in the last couple of weeks was not just him being honest, because he can be, he can think that and not say a word. He didn't have to say anything. He was intentionally talking, I think, because he was just trying to find a different way to go about his pregame buildup than he normally had been able to. Because you can't go out and say, well, little old Clemson, no one believes in us anymore. And that's why you've seen several programs briefly make it to the mountaintop. You've really only seen one of them sustain it for a long period of time, and that's Alabama. And that's because you never hear that out of them. They don't ever really talk about that disrespect stuff. And if they do, it's isolated. And you can certainly tell that's not the fabric with which the program is woven with. That's just not the way they do it because it's no way to sustain. And so even bigger to me than watching the transition from Trevor Lawrence to DJ Uyangale and these defenders growing up, even more interesting to me than that is how the different approach may look from Dabo moving forward. Because I think he senses that. I think he gets that. You've used one source of motivation to get where you are. It doesn't work now because you're there. So are you going to wait to fall back down a few rungs before you can use it again? Or are you going to find a different way to run the program? Now, that's in the future. As for the present, Ohio State is going to the national championship game. And there are a couple of things where I was thinking about this early on. So I was thinking about the matchup with Alabama. And I'm thinking about a couple of advantages for either side. I can tell you on one side of things... The weaknesses, the vulnerabilities that Ohio State was able to exploit last night with Clemson was, again, a very suspect offensive line for Clemson when it comes to a championship caliber team and the lack of elite playmaking types out wide. 
Alabama has both of those. They're A-plus in both of those categories. Their offensive line is one of, if not the best, in college football, and that's even with the absence of Landon Dickerson on the inside, which I do think matters, by the way. And they've got Devontae Smith and company. But when I say and company, it also includes the possibility of Jalen Waddell playing. But if he doesn't, you've still got several other options like Mechie, Jaleel Billingsley has really come on strong. you got a dependable pass-catching threat in Slade Bolden. They've got options there. But on the other side of things, as I just mentioned, how do you throw the crowbar and the bicycle spokes? You do it by disrupting timing, disrupting rhythm. And if you're going to do that, it's not necessarily always edge pressure. You don't always have to have a Chase Young type. You can have a lot of those studs on the interior of your defensive line and collapse the interior of that pocket and try and make Mac Jones move his launch point. Mac Jones is not Justin Fields. He's not Trevor Lawrence. He's not overly mobile. And so that potentially, just an early, early look down the road, is how you could see that game tilting a little bit. But overall, in that postgame situation at last night, when you had every reason to trash Clemson if you wanted to publicly, didn't hear a word of it, didn't hear an ounce of it. You had one side that was run a lot like a frat house, and you had the other side that was run a lot like a military academy, and I appreciated it. You, you, you operate however you want to if you're Clemson leading up to the game, that's fine. As long as you have to take the field and back it up, I have no problem with whatever comes out of your mouth. I don't have to like it, but I don't have a problem with it. But Ohio State, immense respect for the way they went about their business, pre-game, in-game, post-game. And so 49-28 is the final there. Buckeyes now go on to face the Alabama Crimson Tide for a national championship in a game that many people who will be paid to cover thought we'd never be able to see.